Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our first virtual Western Water 411 event. We're going to officially begin the program now, as I've seen um, several of you have had a chance to join. My name is Sarah McDonald. I'm Western's Director of Strategic Communications. And at Western, we heard from you that you wanted more opportunities to connect with us. So we started the Western Water 411 event to do just that. We usually hold these town hall style events in person twice a year, but thanks to COVID-19, the pandemic restrictions have, well, they've allowed us to innovate and offer this event virtually to you uh, right where you are. Unlike the traditional in-person event, we launched a new online hub today at 11 a.m. wmwd.com slash water 411. So hopefully you've already had a chance to check that out. But if not, I highly encourage you to take advantage of all of our new resources there designed to help you learn about Western, where your water comes from, and what it takes to bring you safe, reliable, high quality water 24 seven, 365 days per year. Before we dive right into our program, I do have a few housekeeping items for you. We definitely wanna hear from you today. So please send us your questions using the Q&A button located on your screen. Staff will be monitoring these questions and we'll have time to answer some of them after the presentation. If you are having any technical issues, let us know through the Q&A box or email us at outreach at wmwd.com. All of this information is located for you in your chat box. We will show a couple of videos today. So if your connection is a little bit lagging or you're experiencing some technical issues, these vid videos, they're also on our hub. So you can see them there. Today's event, as you've probably noticed, will be recorded. We're gonna be placing a copy of this presentation available on our digital hub. And we're gonna also email it out to anyone that's registered for the 411 event updates. You can even subscribe to automatically be emailed this recording by visiting wmwd.com slash subscribe. And again, if you haven't already done so, be sure to browse the events digital hub after this presentation. As you navigate through the pages, there is a passport you can complete at the end to be entered for a chance to win a water rise prize. And lastly, if you love this program so much, join us for an encore or refer your friends and family for a repeat show at 6 p.m. tonight. Now that those housekeeping items are out of the way, it's my sincerest pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Western's General Manager, Craig Miller. With more than 30 years of engineering and leadership experience, Craig joined Western in 2014. As General Manager, he's responsible for managing our day-to-day -day activities of Western. Think of him as our CEO, who oversees the more than 150 employees working hard behind the scenes to make sure you have water and wastewater services on demand whenever you need it through an exceptional customer experience. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to our host and program, uh, General Manager, Craig Miller. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's really great to be here and have this opportunity to talk to our customers. Um, coronavirus has changed a lot of things that we do and the way we do it, and this is just another one. And uh, we're excited to have this opportunity to provide a virtual uh, update on what's going on at Western, and we hope you do use the question uh, feature. We're, we're doing this for you, our customers. We want to talk about what's important to you. So um, with that, let's go on to the next slide. Well, let me start with our board of directors. So these are our publicly elected board of directors that represent you, the public. Uh, we have board meetings the first and third Wednesdays of every month if you want to join in. They're streamed live. Uh, right now, they're also uh, we're Zooming those, so you can participate that way. Um, we're going to have a change to our board. We have two new board members. They'll be starting in December after the elections are certified. Um, so here are our five members representing five geographic areas, and we're very fortunate this morning that we have one of our directors, Director Brenda Denstadt from Division Three, is here to provide a, a brief welcome. So, Director, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Craig, so much. Appreciate that. Can everybody hear me okay? You're good. Great. Sounds good. Just, just want to make sure our technology is working. So, well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you joining us today. We're really excited to bring this new opportunity to you to continue to engage you our customers to make sure that we hear what your needs are, that we're addressing those, that staff are taking those into consideration as we move forward 
with our daily plannings and our weekly plannings and our monthly plannings so that we can bring all of those wonderful things to light and make sure that we're meeting all of your needs. And we want you to know that we're continuing, even though the pandemic has hit hard and we are struggling as a society right now to figure out new ways to communicate and to continue to do daily business, Western continues to work every single day for you. We are here to continue to serve you, our public, our customers, to make sure that you have water that comes out of your tap every day and that the sewer is being treated properly and everything is functioning at normal capacity. So with that, thank you so much again. We look forward to engaging you, to hearing all of your questions, to continuing to respond to you, our customers, and we appreciate your attendance today. With that, I'll turn it back over to Craig Miller. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Director. From Division Two, representing Division Two is Director Gracie Torres. Gracie, over to you. Hello, everyone. As Craig said, I am Director Torres. I am the representative for Division Two, and I wanna thank you so much for taking out of your evening to join us. I'm extremely excited to be here tonight. One thing that I'm mostly excited about is when we first started these, uh, these 411, 411s, I said, there's gotta be a way to go virtual. Well, 2020 has given us the chance. So I, I'm excited about it. I think you have a great program and, and you have an opportunity to ask questions um, uh, all the panelists, including myself. So if you have any questions for me, please reach out. I will also be providing my contact info in the chat for you. Uh, 2020 has been a rough year, right? We've, we've going from losing our favorite Laker to po possibly having a curfew in the, next, in the next month. It's been very rough. But what you'll learn today is that it has not impacted the delivery of your water or the quality. Thanks to Western staff and diligence, and hard work, you've still been able to get the great quality water that, that Western customers get. In Division Two, there's also been major accomplishments. Significant leaks uh, have been repaired at Alessandro Boulevard, as well as Lake Point and, and others. Facility repairs and improvements have been made at uh, the Oleander pump station, as well as a replacement of an engine control at the Holcomb pump station. And some great engineering, uh, engineering accomplishments have happened at the La Sierra pipeline. The Graber pipeline was replaced, which is in, at the March Air Force, uh, Air Force Base, as well as the reservoir management system was installed at the Lauren Reservoirs. Like I said, this pandemic has not slowed us down. If anything else, it's made us stronger, as well as showcase our empathy by being one of the first water districts before the state to put a moratorium on water shutoffs as well as on late fees. So if you are a customer at Western, be sure that we have your back through this pandemic and ensuring that you have your water. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy this Water 411. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Director Torres. All right. Let's, let's get rolling. We got a lot to present today. Uh, let me give you a little overview of the presentation. We'll start off talking a little bit about Western and who we are. Uh, we'll talk about water supplies because most people don't understand where their water comes from in Riverside. So uh, we'll spend some time on that. We'll talk about some of our major capital projects and what we're doing to improve your system reliability. And uh, then we'll talk about some of our recent accomplishments, uh, the value of Western's water. I think people need to understand that. What are you paying for when you pay your monthly bills? Uh, you pay for a lot, and we're going to show you there's a lot going on. We fly under the radar screen, as Director Denstead said, but uh, we're, we're doing a lot, and we think it's important to share with you everything that's going on. Then we'll have that Q&A session at the end, and I've got a few of my teammates here at Western that will help answer those questions if they're needed. So let's get rolling. Next slide, please, Michael. Water. We love it. It supports us and a lot of what we love in this world. You probably never thought much about it because it's always there for you. But the safe, high quality and reliable Western water that supports the things you love thinks about you a lot. We live in a pretty dry region with limited local water supplies, but luckily, 
Western works to bring snowflakes from the Sierra Nevada mountains, so you have the water you need. Starting out as a single snowflake in the Sierra Nevada mountains, your water melts and flows to Lake Oroville, traveling more than 500 miles to get to you here in Riverside and Marietta. Western also sources local water by capturing rainfall and treating groundwater. Our top priority is to make sure your water meets or exceeds state and federal standards. This means we blend local and imported water, then test it more than 30,000 times every year. To make it to your home, Western pumps your water uphill to the water tanks and reservoirs that connect the pipeline systems to your home. With a little help from gravity, your water arrives, allowing you to experience the things you love. Living in a dry region developed on rock, water is not as easily accessible as one might think. Western will always need to get some of your water from hundreds of miles away, but we continue to work hard to secure more sources of local water. With infrastructure, partnerships, and ingenuity, we are maintaining local networks to bring you safe and reliable water. All of this is to say that at Western, we think about water all day, so you don't have to. All you need to know is that we will always be here for you. We work to bring you safe and reliable local water, so you have the water you need. We do it for you and for your love of water. All right, let's get into uh, Western and who we are. So at Western, we provide water, wastewater, recycled water to nearly a million people. That's, that's a pretty big region. We uh, serve 25,000 retail uh, customers. We're also a wholesaler. So what does that mean? We provide water to 13 uh, different agencies and eight wholesale customers. So we're, we're the one that imports the water. We sell it to places like Corona, Elsinore, uh, Temescal Valley, uh, Rancho California Water District, and others. So those customers don't see Western on their bill. They see those other entities. But we provide the imported water that's coming from Northern California or the Colorado River. We're a metropolitan member agency, which is an important thing. We have a board member, Don Galliano, that sits on the Metropolitan Board and Metropolitan is the, the big agency. They're actually the largest uh, water district in the country that is responsible for bringing water from Northern California or from the Colorado River. So that imported water is coming from varying sources, and we'll talk more about that shortly here. So let's go to the next slide. So we are one of the largest public entities in Riverside County. Uh, we serve an area of 527 square miles. It's a little bit difficult to see on this graphic, but the hatched areas uh, on that graphic are where our retail customers are. So we actually provide that retail service. We're out there maintaining the infrastructure. The bills come from uh, Western and you're paying Western. The other areas are those wholesalers and they're the ones that do the interface with the retail customers. Let's go to the next slide. So let's start talking about water sources. If we go out in the community and we ask people where your water comes from, we get all kinds of answers. And it, California water is difficult and it's complicated. And California has one of the most sophisticated water supply systems in the world. So what's, what's in Western's water portfolio? So I'm going to focus mostly on our retail customers. So this is the Riverside service area and the Marietta service area. We provide our water, 38% of it's coming from local sources and 62% of it is coming from imported water, so from other parts of the state. So that's how we provide our demand to our local retail uh, customers. Next slide. So here's a picture of the state, and uh, you can see how far our water is coming from. So our primary source of imported water is coming from Northern California. All the rain falls in Northern California, and the people are primarily in Southern California. So that's why the state has developed this sophisticated system to move water around. So our water starts in Lake Oroville and the uh, top of the state comes through the Sacramento Delta into the aqueduct. And that's that aqueduct that you see when you drive along the five freeway to Northern California. And think about all the mountains that you're going through between Southern California and Northern California. Those drops of water have to be pumped over the mountains and that's expensive. The second 
place that we can get our water is from the Colorado River. So it starts in Lake Havasu, comes through the desert to Southern California. The other line that you see on this graphic, and a lot of people ask this question, is that pipeline that goes up to Owens Valley, up you know, towards Mammoth Lake, and do we get our water from there? No, that's Los Angeles. It's Los Angeles invested in that system. It only goes to Los Angeles. It doesn't provide us with any water. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a graphic that you saw in that video. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, all-encompassing of our water supplies. It can be broken into a couple different sections. If you look at the top section, it's showing how that drop of water starts in the Sierras. It goes through Lake Oroville. It goes into the state project through all those canals, through the Delta, gets pumped over the Tehachapis, and it comes to Mills Treatment Plant up here off of Alessandro in Riverside up on a hill. Right, so that water has to be moved again, back up onto the hill again to the treatment plant. And then it's treated and it's put into Western's distribution system. So that's the imported side, that's the 62%. Where's the 38% come from? Well, a couple different sources. So it's important to have uh, local supplies for reliability. Think what would happen if, to us if we were totally dependent upon state project water and there was an earthquake in the Central Valley and that uh, canal was broken or the lift station was broken, we would be out of water. So we need some diversity. So you look at our local supplies in that lower part of the graphic and you can see a Victoria recharge basin on there. So we'll show some pictures of that. That's a new project for us. But as a drop of water falls in the hills above Riverside, it flows downhill into that facility and it's percolated into the ground. How do we get it back out of the ground? We have a desalter. Uh, the Arlington desalter that extracts that water. And we'll have customers that say, why don't we do ocean desal? Well, we're not next to the ocean, so it's hard to do ocean desal, but we do our own desal. This is a brackish groundwater treatment facility. So we, same technology as ocean desal, we pump that water out of the ground. Where we pump it out of the ground, it's uh, fairly high in salts. The desalter knocks that right down as it does with ocean water. Then we put it into our pump system. We've got to pump it back up the hill to where all of our customers are. So there's a lot of cost in that treatment and that pumping. Those two sources blend, and then they go to your home. And then to complete the picture, after it leaves your home, we also collect the wastewater or the sewage. We put it through our treatment processes, and that water is then reused again. So some of it goes to the ocean, and the rest is, is reused. So 499 miles of pipe in our system on the water side and almost 150 miles of pipe on the wastewater side and 48 miles of pipe on the recycled water side. So you can imagine it takes a lot of work to build and maintain and plan all those facilities, and that's what we do for you. Next slide. So how are we doing that? Let's look at a few of our capital projects. So this last year, we've spent $30 million on capital projects. Next year, we're going to spend $28.2 million. Uh, we're trying to help alleviate some of those uh, expensive costs by getting uh, financing. And we really took advantage of the finance market uh, earlier this spring as things were um, falling into the coronavirus environment. Uh, we saw that the bond market was very, very favorable. So we went out to the bond market and refinanced some of our debt. We actually saved our customers about $9 million over the life of those bonds. So that was a really advantageous opportunity we took advantage of. But we also got new money. So we got about $25 million to continue our capital improvement programs to improve your reliability. So we're building local supplies like I said, you want to be diversified, just like in your own personal finances, your water system needs to be diversified. Five years ago, our retail customers were 100% dependent upon imported water. That's a difficult position to be in. If there's something wrong with that system, we would really be in trouble with our customers. So we've re reduced that to 60%, and we've done that through these local partnerships and local projects that we've been doing. And that increases our stability of our costs it also increases our reliability for our customers. Next slide. So let's take a look at a couple of those projects. One of the big ones that if you live over in the La Sierra area, you saw this happening. We had a five mile long pipeline that went up La Sierra uh, Avenue. It took us over a year to build that pipeline. Next slide. 
lot of heavy equipment, a lot of shoring, 30-inch diameter pipeline, and that pipeline goes from down in the valley where our desalter is up on top of the hill where our service to our customers and that interconnection point is. Next slide. So it takes a long time, got to get the streets back in shape again. We appreciate what our customers uh, went through, uh, and that was a very successful project. Next slide. So after you build the pipeline that goes up the hill, um, you have to build a pump station. You got to power it. You got to get the water pushed up the hill. Well, this is the Sterling pump station, and here's an early picture of the Sterling pump station. This is located right on the 91 freeway. You drive by it if you're going down the 91. That's Magnolia Avenue that you see in the background crossing. So you see the hole in the ground there? That's where the reservoir is going to go. Uh, next slide. Here's the rev reservoir coming out of the ground. You see the pump station being constructed. Those are the the pumps that'll lift that water and push it up through the La Sierra pipeline up to our retail customers. Next slide. Here's what it looks like now. So you've got all the pumps connected, everything's ready to go. Next slide. And the final view that you see if you go by it on the freeway today. So that pump station is, is ready for action and it's completed. Next slide. So this is the Victoria Recharge Basin. So uh, when you extract this groundwater out of the ground, you want to make sure that that's sustainable. So we developed this project to put water back in the ground. So this was a vacant parcel that we acquired. It's 10 acres in size. Uh, you can't really tell, but water would flow across this field and just kind of sheet flow across this field, then across Victoria Avenue. So Victoria Avenue is running at the bottom of the screen. Jackson is the other street that you see. So now as that water comes out of the fields, now the hills up above uh, the Victoria area, we're now going to capture it in this facility and put it back into the ground, and then that water will be extracted in the Arlington desalter and sent through the Sterling pump station, up the hill uh, in the La Sierra pipeline, and that'll blend with other imported water sources up on the hill and provide a great source of water for our customers. Next slide. So there's a couple of shots of developing that system. This is the recharge uh, facility. Next slide. Nearing completion. Next slide. Another project. So this is uh, the Northwell Rehabilitation Project. So if we shift our focus down to the Murrieta service area, Murrieta, a little more fortunate than the Riverside service area, they do have groundwater. So about half of the water that we serve in our Murrieta service area is coming out of the ground. So here's what happens to wells when they're really old. These, uh, this is the well casing you're looking at. It's all rusted out and it starts failing. So this was our North Well Rehabilitation Project. So we pull all that casing out of the ground and then we drill a new well and we put casing back in. So let's go to the next slide. So this is an interesting picture. So this is drilling that well, and uh, this is a problem we deal with all the time. Our wells are there uh, before the neighborhoods, and then developers come, and they maximize the use of the property, and they built this neighborhood right around our well. The challenge is when we have to rehabilitate that well, we're right in people's backyards doing that. So we built sound attenuation wells and went through this, this project. We had uh, a great outreach program with our neighbors, uh, and these neighbors were fantastic. Uh, they put up with this project, and uh, it's not easy. The, the drilling went 24-7, so uh, hats off, and all the rest of the customers should be thanking these customers for putting up with this project. But it, it's completed now. Next, next slide. So here's what it looks like after you drill and you put a, a motor on the pump. This project is uh, nearing completion. You can see the construction equipment still out there today as we finish the uh, above ground facilities and get that uh, the, the pumping uh, controls all put in place. So this one's almost, almost online, we can't wait for it because without this project and the ability to pump this groundwater, we're buying additional imported water for this service area, which costs more than twice as much. So we wanna get this online so we can start saving money and not buying that expensive imported water. Next slide. Another project that, that we implemented this year 
is our smart meter replacement program. So the meters that you see in those meter boxes in your parkway along the street that measures the flow that comes into your, your house, they wear out too. And when they wear out, they stop reading, which means that you're taking water through the meter and it's not registering. So you're using water, but there's no one paying for that water. So uh, we've gone through and rehabilitated our meters and it's a three phase program. We finished the first phase. We've put about, I think it's about 11,000 meters in place now. And uh, we're replacing your old meter with new technology. And these are smart meters. And what these smart meters will do is give us 15 minute reads on your water usage. What's the benefit there? When customers call us because they have a high water bill, we can go back and look at the records and say, yeah, we see exactly when your water usage changed. And this is when you had a leak, or this is when you left something running. It actually gives us the ability to proactively contact our users and say, hey, we're seeing some funny usage that doesn't match your past usage. Uh, is something going on? So great tool that we'll have implemented when we finish phase three of this program. But the other thing is it's given us a lot of financial stability because our water loss figures, what we calculate to track our water purchases against what we're receiving revenue for, have dropped by almost 9% with the impl implementation of these new meters. So it's been a really good tool for us financially, and it's a great tool for our customers to be able to use to get uh, control over their water usage. Next slide. Here's what it looks like when it goes in the ground. You can see this. If you pull, pull a lid on, on your box, you can see how it's registering your usage. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about recent accomplishments, what's been going on at, at Western. Well, it's hard to talk about recent things without going into coronavirus. Um, we're an essential provider, so you know our operation staff has been here full time. They haven't skipped a beat since coronavirus started. Uh, coronavirus has absolutely no impact on your water quality or your supply. Uh, traditional water treatment um, techniques work perfectly well with uh, coronavirus. Our wastewater services are uninterrupted. The same treatment techniques that we've always used to control virus in the wastewater system controls coronavirus. So our staff, operating staff, has done a great job of staying on the job. It's been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we've had to change our schedules to provide our workers with that protection. We've broken them into smaller kind of pods that stay together, so we've had to adjust. It's forced our, our staff into longer days but it's actually kept them very well protected. And we've, we've come through so far, fingers crossed, very well on coronavirus cases here at Western. Um, our board uh, approved uh, a, a program where we would not shut people off during coronavirus. So we suspended shutoffs and late fees. The governor, I'm sure you heard this, the governor then came back a couple months later and said, yeah, there won't be any shutoffs. Well, our board had been proactive and taken that step ahead of the board. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't have to pay their bills. We aren't shutting people off, but you're still responsible for paying your bills. So I know we have customers that can't afford to pay because they've been laid off or lost their jobs. Um, so we're going to work with them when we, we contact those customers and start try and start a payment program because we're very concerned about if they let that bill build up for a year, how they're going to get out from underneath that. So if this is pertaining to you, call our customer service and start working on a program so that you can pay those bills. Uh, we continue to monitor state guidelines and the county reopening status. So right now we have all of our board meetings virtually. We're closed to the public, but as the county reopens, we'll follow with the county and we'll be reopening our facilities at the right time. The other thing that our board took an action on was to try and help out some of our customers that can't afford their bills. So we increased our uh, bill assistance program, bill paying assistance program by over 400%. So if you're interested in exploring that, contact our customer service and ask them about how to apply for that. Next slide. Efficiency programs. We have a lot of efficiency programs. So if you're remodeling your house or you're upgrading appliances or you're redoing your yard, make sure you contact us. Go on our website. We have a great website that shows how to do this. We provide a lot of rebates so you can save money by doing this. 
So take advantage of these programs. We put a lot of time and effort into it. Metropolitan Water District puts a lot of time and effort into it. So make sure you review the options and maybe we can help you out and lower the cost of the work that you're doing. Next slide. The other thing that we do, you know, we talk about capital programs to build local projects, but, you know, it's not that easy anymore. The, you know, the, the kind of the, the easy water's been uh, kind of uh, soaked up by, by everyone, and now it gets more complicated. We've been busy this year on working on agreements with neighboring agencies to improve our water resources, our local water resources. So here's two examples of agreements that we've completed this year, one with Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District. And this is an opportunity where Elsinore is actually utilizing facilities that we built years ago. And this is how they, Elsinore, gets their imported water from Northern California. So we have an agreement now with, with Eastern where they can, they've secured permanent capacity in that system so that they can have uh, future certainty in their use of imported water. And we've exchanged that for a lease program where we can lease local water from Elsinore. Elsinore didn't have an ability to utilize that local water, but they owned rights to that water. So in exchange for us giving them capacity to increase imported water, we're getting their capacity to utilize local water in San Bernardino. So a real win-win project for both. Then with Riverside, RPU, we're kind of doing the opposite thing. We're kind of buying into their system. So we entered into an agreement. They have uh, some surplus water that they're not utilizing, groundwater that they're not utilizing. So we buy into their system and we use their system to transport that water to our system. So that's a 20-year agreement. It's great for our customers. It gives them a less expensive, local, reliable source of water. And it's great for Riverside because we're contributing uh, money to RPU for the use of their assets that they've already built. And so it's a revenue source for the re city of Riverside. Very unique, uh, innovative programs and available because of the great partnerships that our boards maintain and the ability to work together and share resources. Next slide. Value of Western's water. So this is something that I think goes un unnoticed by people or maybe underappreciated by people. Think what your life would be like without water. You know, our, our service area in Riverside is built on top of, like we, we like to say it's built on top of a rock. There's no groundwater underneath our service area. So we have to import it all, whether it's local water from Riverside or San Bernardino or local water from the Arlington Basin through our desalters or it's imported water. All of our water has to be brought in to the service area. And without that water, there wouldn't be an area. So there wouldn't be the Woodcrest area and the Mission Grove area. Our water brings life to that area. So there's a huge value for water. Let's go to the next slide. You may only know Western Municipal Water District as the people who send you a bill every month. But what you may not know is that there's a lot going on behind that bill to make sure you receive safe and reliable water and sewer services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We understand that billing statements can be complex and sometimes downright confusing, but rest assured, Western's here to help you understand your billing statement and how what you pay directly relates to your water's journey to your tap. Let us break it down for you. From more than 700 miles away, your water starts in the Sierra Nevada mountains, traveling all the way to our beautiful region that has been built on rock with limited local water supplies. More than 60% of your water takes this long, energy-intensive and expensive trip to get to you right here in Western Riverside County. Your water flows through hundreds of miles of open aqueducts and pipelines, and this journey to your tap is not cheap. The Metropolitan Water District of Southern California supplies Western's imported water from Northern California. This is where Western comes in. We provide consistent and reliable access to this water supply through the MWD readiness to serve charge you may see on your bill. In fact, to decrease our reliance on imported water, Western invests in water supply projects and partnerships to increase access to local water. 
These investments establish reliability and redundancy, which is a complex way of saying that Western's water reliability charge means you will always have the water you need when you need it. After the water makes its way into our region or is drawn from a groundwater source, it is treated and rigorously tested before it makes its way into Western's delivery system. In fact, we test your water more than 30,000 times per year to make sure you receive nothing but the best. To guarantee quality that meets and exceeds state and federal standards and service reliability, each water user is charged a system charge. This charge helps support the growing costs of system maintenance, repair and replacement, as well as water treatment, testing, usage monitoring, and an overall exceptional customer experience. Inside Western's delivery system, imported and local water are transported using a number of pumps and pressurized pipelines. The pumping charge you may see on your billing statement supports the cost of the energy needed to move the water to Western storage tanks in your area. Finally, with the help of gravity and more pressurized pipe, your water makes its way to your home. With a simple turn of the tap, you and your family have on-demand access to safe, reliable water. Your total water charge is made up of the water you use daily for indoor and outdoor activities, like washing your hands, doing the dishes, running full loads of laundry, or watering your plants. Understanding your water's journey to your tap will help you read your water bill and make informed decisions about managing water usage. Using our customer dollars responsibly, Western is able to deliver safe, reliable water when you need it, 100% of the time. Western will keep it flowing, now and for future generations. All right, that's a great little video. Uh, so what's in the future for Western and for the water industry? So we, we collaborate through our water associations and statewide and nationally, and we all face a lot of the similar challenges. But one of the things that are more, is more specific to Western is the increasing cost of imported water. We talk about that 60% of the water that's coming from Northern California. We don't have control over the costs of that water. We buy that water from Metropolitan. As Metropolitan's costs go up to do all the same things we do, they just do it on a larger scale, but they're replacing capital, they're pumping water, they're treating water, they're monitoring water. All those costs accumulate and we pay those costs and we don't have control over those costs. That's another reason we would like local water because we can control those costs a lot better. So that increasing cost of imported water is, is uh, an ongoing concern. Expanding water quality requirements, this is how the water industry will always go. There's always something new on the horizon that we watch out for. Uh, we get scientists and health experts involved. You may have heard of PFAS. You know, you've heard of uh, other things in the past. Uh, you've heard of arsenic, other things. There's, there's always some water quality challenge that we have to stay in front of because the water we serve is safe. We promise it'll be safe. We're going to guarantee that it's safe. And in order to do that, we have to be in front of the regulations, and we have to make sure that we're able to treat or make sure that we don't have those things in our supply. So that always always is an increasing demand on our system. And how about climate change? I get asked this question a lot. What's going to happen to Western with climate change? How does that affect us? Well, we'll, we'll see changing patterns in hydrology. So we'll see maybe more intense rainfall. Maybe we'll see um, more fluctuations from year to year. You'll have very wet years, very dry years. You have some years with big storm pack. You might have some years where it's rain and you know it's warmer we don't get the snowpack so we have to figure out how to be able to collect and move water in all those uh, circumstances and as it comes faster we have to come up with better ways to capture it and the water industry is always struggling to find more storage for water as it comes faster you got to put it somewhere well i'm sure most of you know it's not easy to build reservoirs and it's not easy to build dams so how do we uh, overcome that challenge of a flush of water in a very short period of time. That Victoria Recharge Basin that I was talking about earlier, that's one of the things that we've done to capture local water. But you can tell it's not a deep reservoir, it's not a dam. It can't capture a lot of water, but it can capture some. So it's a lot more projects like that to try and prepare ourselves for potential climate changes. 
And then the other thing is aging infrastructure. A lot of our infrastructure is old, it's getting old. We have to have the finances to repair that infrastructure. And that's where, you know, we have to put that on our bills. It's incorporated into the cost that we charge our customers because we have a regular plan where every year we're replacing segments of pipelines, pumps. You saw the North Well, which was an infrastructure replacement project. So we have to continue to figure out how to collect enough money and how to plan the right projects to replace those um, parts of the system that are wearing out and doing it at the right time. We don't want to do it before it's time and we don't want to let it start failing and so we lose reliability in our system. So some huge challenges and you know we take these on, we're happy to take those on, we enjoy these challenges and uh, we do that on behalf of our customers. Next slide. Well, that, that completes my, uh, my presentation this morning for you. Uh, we're now ready to uh, answer questions. I've got a little team of experts here with me that'll ha help answer the questions. Uh, Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. I know you're kind of moderating the, the questions and reading what's coming in. So um, hit us with a question if you got it, we're ready. Great. Well, thank you, Craig. Uh, like you mentioned, we are moving into our Q&A portion of our live update today. So I just want to remind anyone joining us, um, please submit your questions. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. Um, so while, while we're looking for those to continue coming in, uh, our first question, Craig, is how does Western plan for future growth in Riverside County? And is there enough water to supply all of this growth? Huh. That's a great question. So uh, you talked about industry challenges. This is an industry challenge. Um, right now, we're, we're actually in really good shape. So a decade ago, we did a lot of planning based on water being a very finite resource. It's still a finite resource. But because a lot of the conservation that our customers and other customers have done, uh, demands have been down for a few years. And so that means we actually have surplus water, which which is great. But we always plan for growth, and uh, that's a natural um, need for a community. We're not in charge of how the community grows. That's the county and that's the city. We just ensure that we can provide water when that growth happens. So we monitor it all the time. We prepare our facilities for growth. We go out and look for new sources of water for growth. But we definitely plan for steady and uh, uh, routine growth and we're always looking 20 years ahead and we work with the county and with the city to look at their planning documents to make sure that we're prepared for that growth. Great. Well, next question. In thinking about the recent fires uh, in Northern California and other areas, is Western prepared to provide water for such large fires in our area? Uh, we are. I might turn this over to our director of engineering, Derek Kawai. He does a lot of the work on fire flows and planning where fire hydrants go and thinking about how our system can meet fire fire demand. So, Derek, can you help me out on that one? Sure, sure, no problem. So, essentially, um, the question is, is that do we have enough water in order to provide fire flow? Um, we have a requirement to um, maintain enough um, water within our reservoirs. We have a fire flow level that we maintain at all times in all of our reservoirs so that um, if there is a fire, um, that it can uh, feed the needs that are specified by the fire department. And that would be for putting out fires um, for any of the homes or for um, industry or for communities. And each one of those have different flows. And um, um, each time that we have a new project go up, we um, make sure that it can actually provide that flow by um, doing um, hydraulic modeling, as well as um, physically testing the hydrants. We'll actually open up the hydrants, see how much water is coming out of there. And um, then we'll model that to see what that flow would be um, to make sure that it can meet the requirements of the, um, of the fire department. Um, so yes, we, we do have enough water to meet um, fire demands. And can I go ahead and, and throw a couple of uh, mm -hmm. comments in there as well? When we're looking at this problem and we look at fire and we look at emergency status situations, we do have mutual aid agreements set across the region with our partner agencies that we deal with. And when we've had instances of fire, we've all come together and we all 
are able to collaborate together to see each other through those instances. So I wanna make you sure that everyone is understanding that we do work very closely with all of the agencies in the area. We have great cooperation with them and mutual aid agreements in place. Thanks guys. Great, well that sort of brings us to um, one of our next customer questions. Um, how is Western coordinating with others who have land water rights and are we evaluating their consumption? Um, are, how do we, how do we uh, collaborate with other uh, people with water rights? Is that, is that the question? So, that is the question, uh, yes. I talked, I talked a little bit about uh, what we're doing with Elsinore and what we're doing with, with Riverside and uh, acquiring, acqu acquiring water rights is really difficult. Uh, they're pretty much spoken for. So we did as an agency acquire water rights and we actually bought those off of someone else earlier this year. So we did acquire some water rights, but um, there are water rights in Southern California that go unutilized. And what we're doing with other entities is trying to fully utilize those water rights. So we're entering into agreements so that we can share those. And the, the way it ends up working is we don't acquire a permanent right, but we acquire the use of, of those rights when no one else is using it. So it allows us to maximize the use, uh, saves us uh, a little bit of cost on not having to acquire those permanently but it allows us to provide no, more local water into our system. Great, well, we do have time for a few more questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, send the next one on over. Why does my cost of water continue to go up even though I'm being really efficient in using my water? <laughs> this is a great one and I'm, I'm gonna stall. I have got our finance director on and he's gonna answer that. But um, the, overall, there are a lot of people that say, water is free, Why, what am I paying for? And what you're paying for is the movement of that water. So that drop of water that falls in the hills in Riverside and finds its way down to the Victoria Recharge Basin, that, water, that drop of water didn't cost anything. We captured it, but we had to build the facility. And then we have to put it in the ground, we have to maintain the facility, and then we have to pump it out, and then we have to treat it, and then we have to pump it again. So it's that movement that we have to pay for. And as Kevin's about to tell you, that is what is baked into the water rates along with your use of water. So Kevin, could you give us a few more details? Sure, that's a great answer, Craig, thank you. Um, one of the things to, to know in how we design our rate structure is that we always apply the lowest cost local water to our tier one, our indoor water use. So that indoor water use is for health, safety, sanitation, that type of thing. So, we always apply our, in our tiered rate structure when we calculate rates, that lowest cost of local water goes right into that tier one. And then our next highest uh, cost of water goes into tier two, which is primarily used for outdoor water use as well too. So as you conserve, what that ends up doing is you end up having less deliveries in your tier two, your outdoor water use, and therefore your overall cost of water goes down. See how that works too. So conserving, fantastic, using water e efficiency, absolutely a must for our region and it's greatly appreciated amongst all of our customers but still costs are rising as craig said the cost of bringing that water getting it to your home safely and reliably that's the bulk of the cost thank you kevin for that and um, i'll add one more thing on top of that and this is the philosophy of the water industry now as to how you charge your customers for water um, back in back in the day water was sold based on volume so, you know, the, the more volume you took, the more you paid. And what's really changed in the way water is billed to customers is because we have to maintain all this infrastructure and the maintenance of that infrastructure, the rehabilitation of it, the expansion of it is not dependent upon how much water you take on a daily basis. That infrastructure has to be in place to meet your needs in your house when you turn it on 24-7, 365. So, that cost has to be baked into the rates. We can't fluctuate the revenue source based on whether you take water or you don't take water as the sole revenue source. Think what would happen in when there's a, a, a really wet year and no one has to irrigate outside. 
if we didn't include uh, a bill that that was going to recover costs for all that infrastructure, and everyone turned out their turned off their outdoor educate outdoor irrigation, sorry, we would have to go through this constant process of changing water rates all the time, and we just can't do that. So we put these charges into the bill. So you saw, see a small fluctuation based on your usage, but a lot of the bill is for our fixed costs. Since we're talking about dollars, I'll go ahead and give another question related. Why is my neighbor's bill so much lower than mine? I'm guessing it wasn't specified, but I'm guessing their neighbor may not be a Western customer. Um, let me turn that over to our deputy general manager, uh, Tim Barr. Tim, you want to take a, a shot at answering that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, assuming that the customer is, for example, a Riverside Public Utilities customer living in Riverside and comparing um, a bill from Western, Riverside Public Utilities delivers 100% of their water from the San Bernardino Basin area. They need to move it a total of 12 miles. The majority of Western's Riverside water comes from Lake Oroville, 700 miles away. And we have to purchase that water from Metropolitan Water District, which is about $1,100 for 325,000 gallons of water an acre foot. Much higher cost to, to deliver water from Northern California than from Northern Riverside or San Bernardino County. Great, well, with just a few minutes left, I wanna be sensitive of everyone's time. I'm gonna go ahead and give one final question for this morning's session. Um, and a reminder, if you still are on the line, feel free to continue sending us your questions. We'll track those down and make sure we get you your answers. Um, so final question, what are some projects Western has planned for the next couple of years? Well, I will, I, we could all answer this. We work on our projects and our capital programs extensively. Uh, Derek, you want to take a crack at that one first? Sure. Um, actually, um, we do actually have a capital improvements and facility plan that we're publishing, um, and you can find it up, up on, I believe it's up on our website. Um, and, uh, you know, I have it like, I don't know if I can make it show it, but in any case, it, it describes, and there's a huge book in here that basically lists off all the projects that we have, um, just to um, name a few of them. Um, uh, I don't know if I can go through and name each one. We're doing a lot of um, pipeline replacement um, that we have uh, coming up. We're replacing a, um, a switch gear, which is basically uh, changes voltage um, um, that's going to our pumps, um, running our pumps. Um, we've got another project that's, um, we're just finishing up the design on a sewer force main um, replacement. Um, but again, if you go to our website and you'll, you can download this report, the Capital Improvement and Facilities Plan, it's a beautiful report. It basically has photos of what all the projects are, where they are, um, how much they cost, how we went about um, prioritizing all the projects um, and uh, what they'll accomplish. Um, and so that would be the best place to get all of that type of information. I, I'll add uh, one more exciting project that we're working on. We're partnering with Eastern on a really innovative project to extract groundwater uh, from the um, Moreno Valley area around March Air Reserve Base. March is our customer, and uh, we're going to extract water, treat that water, and split the water between Eastern customers and Western customers. And because of where it's located, that water will be uh, served to the March Air Reserve Base. So uh, a great lower cost water, local water, and the side benefit for that project is they do have a rising groundwater issue in that whole area. And so extracting this groundwater and treating and serving it is going to not only give us a more reliable source of water, a lower cost water, it's also going to alleviate a rising groundwater challenge that we're seeing that's starting out in that area. So that's a really exciting project that's going to come on board in the next two years. And Craig, could you go ahead and mention the fact that we've gotten some grant money to do that project and how successful staff has been at the district in pushing forward projects with a lot of grant money. We've been one of the more successful agencies. If you could go ahead and just kind of let people know we're working hard for dollars that are coming in for uh, taking care of a lot of these projects. Uh, a typical director comment 
they're always looking for money to help out the customers. And uh, I'm an engineer, so I gave you a typical engineering answer. We're looking at how do we build a project. But um, our, our board is always uh, pushing us hard to find other sources of money. And this is, you know, thank you for, for highlighting that because that's what the customers need to hear about. So that's a $90 million project that we're talking about. And we've actually received half of the money for that project from the state. So we're getting $45 million out of the state to offset the cost for our customers. So thank you, Director, for reminding us because we're, we, we think from an engineering and a water supply standpoint, but our customers think about it from a cost standpoint. So really important for our customers to hear that. Excellent. Well, with just a few um, minutes to spare, we're going to go ahead and wrap up our live update for this morning. So I want to thank you all for joining us today uh, at the Western Water 411. As I mentioned earlier, we're constantly working to connect with you more often in, in more engaging, more proactive, more transparent and responsive ways. We know your time is very valuable, so we're glad you spent it with us this morning. Again, a copy of this presentation will be posted on our digital hub and emailed to anyone who has registered to receive updates. If you want to subscribe with us, uh, visit wmwd.com slash subscribe, and you'll get that automatically in your email. And as a last reminder, be sure to browse our event digital hub after this presentation at wmwd.com slash water411. And at the end, there's a chance to complete a passport and be entered in to win a WaterWise prize. So you definitely don't want to miss that. And as always, you can visit us on our website or social media where we're sharing the latest news and information about all of our programs and services. So with that, take care, everyone, and we'll see you at the next Western Water 411.